Lesson two, evaluating the tool landscape. Asking the question, how easy is it for me to use this tool, begins to separate the market uh, into groups, groups of tools that we should use and groups of tools that we should not. Five important takeaways. Uh, one is that the ease of use is a personal metric, and together with data density provides a powerful framework for the evolving marketplace. Look, uh, those tools that are easy for you to use might be very different from the tools that are easy for me to use. And it's uh, something also that changes over time. So where data density becomes a little more of a durable or static evaluation measure, measure this second criteria that I'm introducing changes uh, pretty dynamically. When used together, data density and ease of use make it clear which tools analysts should keep in their toolbox and which ones they should discard. And we'll talk about how you can use the framework to direct you there. Each quadrant of the framework we will build uh, uh, will, div uh, will, will give directions to analysts. It, depending on where tools are, will really determine how, uh, how important that tool becomes to you and for what purposes it's used. But regardless, it's important for us to know that no tool, regardless of its costs or its capabilities or its ease of use, is as important as the analyst who uses it. In fact, this leads to the fifth point that's important for us to know, that most companies struggle to make meaningful business decisions regardless of how many tools they have purchased and invested in. And this has led uh, Avinash Kosick to develop what he calls the 1090 rule, which we'll review in this lesson. So we kind of laid out this, these two evaluation criteria, capability, which again was the data density and made clear for us those enterprise tools, those point solutions, those analysis gadgets. The second criteria is this idea of ease of use. Um, and again, it is a very personal decision. You need to decide which, which tools are easy for you to learn and use and which ones are not. And that will change over time as well as you gain experience and become more adept at the, the tools you're using. When you use these two criteria in conjunction, you get this really fantastic two-by-two two view of the marketplace where on the horizontal axis, right, we've got, we have tools that are ranging from uh, those that don't handle a great deal of data, again, the analysis gadgets, all the way through to tools that handle a great deal of data, those enterprise solutions. On a vertical axis, we will place ease of use. Those that are harder to use, we'll put at the bottom. Those that are easier for us to use, we'll put at the top. And that creates these four distinct segments. You have in the upper left a set of tools that don't do a great deal, right? This is where you'll find the analysis gadgets, but yet they're really easy for you to use. Again, this is my personal view of what those tools are for me. I use these tools regularly, and, and for an analyst, our challenge would be to find as many and become familiar with as many of these tools as we can, frankly. If we have particular one-off challenges, these tools can fit that need really, really well and do it very, very efficiently. For instance, if I have a word cloud to build, I use Wordle. I love that tool. I always have. There are other tools that would provide word clouds for me, but I, I've never become quite as, as uh, comfortable with them. Wordle is the tool that is important for me. In the upper right, you have tools that are more powerful, right? They can handle much more data density, yet they are still easy to use. Here, we should find our go-to tool. And really, it should be just one. Frankly, find one tool that will handle about 75% of your analytics and data visualization needs and just become masterful in that tool. For me, that's Tableau up here. Um, it's an easy tool to use. It does a great deal for me. It might not always produce the kind of uh, graphics that I want, and for that, I have tools in the other quadrants that I can, that I can utilize. But that tool becomes my go-to visualization tool, and I use it for 75% of the work that I'll do.
In the bottom right, I have tools that are powerful, yet a little more difficult to use. This is where I'd put R, this is where I put D3, this is where I would put Python um, as a tool, certainly, and SQL and others, that require some kind of programming understanding, some coding experience, right? It's a little um, more sophisticated or challenging to use and say, an easy, straightforward tableau. Yet the power of these tools rest or are found in some of that sophistication. Uh, you can do data transformations and visualizations with R that you just can't do with any other tool. So my recommendation here is to find one, two, maybe a couple tools that you'll invest some time in to do some of this, um, this higher level analysis or visualization that you want done. Doesn't mean that we want to learn everything, although as an analyst, uh, that could be your, your objective if that's what you want to do. But finding just a couple tools that supplement that go-to tool to do the things that it can't um, uh, with great amounts of data is an important approach. Finally, we find these tools that are limited in capability and hard to use, and frankly, I wouldn't spend any time with a tool that lands in this quadrant for you. Uh, there are too many easy to use tools with great capability, uh, and your go-to tool will do most of the things that you want. Um, and then you can invest some time in some of these more sophisticated tools that have the power you're looking for. If something is limited in its capability and yet hard to use, we are too busy as analysts to invest time in a tool that's not going to, not going to be valuable for us. So that's how that framework lays out when we talk about capability, data density that a tool can handle, as well as this personal determination of ease of use. That's important for us to learn again because this market is moving and so dynamic that uh, having a framework to, uh, that allows us to think about that market lets us keep it organized. But regardless of how we think of those tools, no tool is as valuable as the analyst. I think this was captured really well in a quote from Avinash Kosick. And Avinash says, no tool would be useful unless you had a Michelle or an Amir or Enrique or Sasha or some analyst who understands your business and has the drive to use that right tool intelligently to deliver actual insights. And that is what it's all about. You know, give me a great analyst and a single tool. They will beat uh, a bad analyst with a plethora of tools anytime. And this also kind of gets to maybe a, a philosophy that, that I would hope to see more brands adopt. And that's the idea that they should invest more in their people than in their tools. Too often, you see brands that, that put down a great chunk of money to buy a fancy, fully loaded enterprise tool, but don't staff that appropriately or don't train their analysts in ways to use that, that well. And that is what led Avinash to introduce this idea of the 1090 rule. And what Avinash says with this 1090 rule is that a company should allocate its budget for analytics in this manner. 10% of that should go to tools, 90% should go to analysts. And at the end of the day, that will create the kind of capability to answer the questions that they want answered and outfit uh, the, the, the analysts appropriately. Too often you see this flipped. Too often you see brands that, that again, invest a great deal of money in, in a tool and just think that they are done uh, and that all of their analytics challenges are going to go away. But by adopting this mindset, we can bring the right kind of talent to our analytics challenges and still outfit them appropriately with tools.